with the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church on this Pentecost Sunday. I'm grateful to see each of you here in person and welcome to each of you watching um, at home or wherever you are on Zoom. I invite you to read responsibly with me our call to worship printed before you. I will begin in the light print. Come and worship. Trust in the one who co-creates the was, the now, and the will be. Follow the one who never breaks covenant. Praise the one whose justice is graceful and inclusive. Amen. Let us pray. Mother God, Father God, we gather on this Pentecost Sunday seeking your Holy Spirit and the assurance that you are always with us. Help us to understand that your spirit is with us in the same way today as it was with the early Christians centuries ago. Remind us again of the many gifts of love, joy, and peace that you have promised that your spirit will bring to all who are open and willing to receive them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John 20, 19 to 23. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I invite you, as you are able, to stand with me as we pray together responsively our prayer of confession and affirmation. Will you stand? I will pray in the light print and you will join in the dark. For ignoring the vision breathed by the living spirit churning deep within our souls. 
For refusing to look at the vision alive within those who look or act or sound different from us. For choosing familiarity, ease, and comfort rather than risking the opportunities afforded in the vision. In love and compassion. God calls us back to the beauty that is deep within our souls. By God's grace, we are made whole. Alleluia. Amen. May the God of new life restore and make new our life together. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Will you extend a word or sign of peace to your neighbor? We expect the spirit to move in all kinds of wild and loud ways on Pentecost Sunday. I promise you there is not a fire underneath this pulpit. For our second reading, we turn to the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of powerful deeds. To another prophecy. To another the discernment of spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. 
For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Will our ushers come forward as we prepare for this time of giving? This Pentecost Sunday marks the end of our spring offering, which we have been collecting since Easter Sunday. And every dollar that has been donated to the spring offering goes to our neighbors in Rolling Fork, Mississippi for tornado relief. So if you have intended to give to that offering and have not had an opportunity to yet, or you are inspired to do so today, please indicate whether you're giving online or in person that your contribution today is for the spring offering and everything else that is given today goes for the general collection that we do every Sunday. May it be in the belief and the hope that the spirit is still wildly moving and blowing among us that we give now. Amen.
As we move into this time of prayer, I want to share that I received word this morning that Bill David, Julie Madden David's husband of nearly 50 years, died peacefully yesterday after many, many years of cancer recurrences and treatments. Um, so we are praying with Julie and with Ann Madden and with all of the Madden fan family at this time um, when we, as we are receiving the news of this loss. Bill was last with us here in the sanctuary for um, our event with Dr. White about New Orleans jazz hymn tradition back in December. Um, and I did not know that he had taken a turn and was, was ill again. So please reach out to Ann and to Julie in the coming days. I know that's not the only concern that you bring with you today, though. So whatever it is that is on your mind and on your heart, know that there is room for it here in this space of prayer, bringing the fullness of who you are and the fullness of where you are as a person today. Let's hold some silence together for just a moment, and then I will bring us out with a spoken word of prayer. Be present with your people, O oh God, in all of the waiting places, waiting for encouraging news, waiting for light to eclipse darkness, waiting for hope to overcome despair. Be present with your people, Lord, when the rush of wind is violent and unwelcome, when homes are torn to shreds, when waters roar and foam, when peace is fragile, whisper words of comfort to those who are living in grief and in fear. Be present with your people, Lord, as agents of love. May we be the ones who proclaim good news in every nation, in every language, in every vernacular. May we speak love so loudly that all may hear and be glad. Be present with your people, Lord, bewildered by your movement as it transforms the ordinary into the extraordinary, the familiar into the unexplainable, so that those who witness it may recognize your power at work. And with caution and trepidation, we ask that you pour out your spirit Pour out your spirit upon your people everywhere that visions may become reality and prophesy, prophecy declared courageously, and that all who call on the name of the Lord shall know love. It is with the steps of Christ before us and the love of God around us and the wild breath of the spirit moving through us that we are bold to live and bold to pray together now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Spirit of the
in one place and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting divided tongues as a fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them all of them were filled with the holy spirit and began to speak in other languages as the spirit gave them ability now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven, heaven listening, living in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, and our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed those, saying, Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my servants, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. My God, let bless the reading and the hearing and the living of this word. <clears throat> I promise this is not tuberculosis. I swallowed pills the wrong way this morning where they feel like they're still stuck in your throat. <clears throat> and I really, I feel like I have gravel in my throat. So, so sorry, but in the age of COVID, you have to announce your coughs. And I just want you to know, I am not spreading poisonous mist across the room that I know of. Well, how about that from some inspiring apocalypse first thing in the morning? The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. And these are the words of the birthday of the church. Well, let's turn to some poetry, not Joel's, but poet Sheswav Miłosz. This is poetry, it's prayer, and I think it may guide us to bringing all of these scripture lessons together this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, bending or not bending the grasses, appearing or not above our heads in a tongue of flame, at hay harvest or when they plow in the orchards or when snow covers crippled firs in the Sierra Nevada. I am only a man. I need visible signs. I tire easily, building the stairway of abstraction. Many a time I asked, you know it well, that the statue in church lift its hand only once just for me. But I understand that signs must be human. Therefore, call one man anywhere on earth, not me. After all, I have some decency. And allow me, when I look at him, to marvel at you. On this Pentecost Sunday, we hold many passages of scripture before us. We hold the familiar grand display of Acts 2, 
alongside a continuation of conversation between Jesus and his disciples in John 14. That's the passage Linda read earlier. We have visited John chapters 13 through 15 numerous times now over the past three months. In these three chapters, Jesus is preparing to leave his disciples and has commanded them to love one another. Over and over, he has claimed to them and said, because you are mine, you must love one another. To love me and know me and follow me is to live in love. Be servants to one another, love as I have loved. You will know God more fully if you live in love just like this. This that Jesus described, this is action. We get it, we understand that, we can do this. We can live in love and follow in the way of Jesus. We can study the stories and go and do likewise. Maybe we don't perfect it, but we generally follow the concept. To love Jesus is then to perform love, to embody love, to act out love in the world. We can at least wrap our brains around that. Love is not sentimentality. It is acting for good in all the world. Then Jesus keeps talking and Philip starts asking questions. If Jesus is the way and knowing Jesus is knowing God, then surely Jesus can just show God to the disciples. Show us the Father and we'll be satisfied, Philip says to Jesus. Do this one thing for me. Make that hand on the statue lift just once, and I promise I'll never ask you for anything ever again. Oh, we love Philip for his directness and his confidence for either pretending or sincerely believing that he wouldn't have a thousand follow-up questions to this one request. Should Jesus actually open a portal to satisfy Philip's curiosity? If the statue in Miwosh's poem had in fact lifted one hand just once, would that have proven the godness of God once and for all? Or would it have merely sparked a new obsession? Jesus doesn't laugh though, and doesn't reprimand Philip for wanting to bring action and mystery closer together. Instead, Jesus muddies things, offers even more mystery. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Somehow embodiment and mystery are unified in the person of Christ. Somehow Jesus is in God and God is in Jesus through the words and ways and actions of Jesus' life. And in the absence of father and son, there will be another advocate to be with Jesus' followers forever. This spirit of truth will continue the work of Jesus in the lives of the disciple, disciples and will also be in them. Oh, this is confusing. Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in Jesus, and the Spirit is in the people, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. It's not Trinity Sunday. I think Philip's question, when we're being honest, it deeply resonates with us. Just show us. Just show us where you're going. Just show us what God is like. We promise we'll be satisfied. We promise our questions will all be answered. Just lift your hand one time and wave at us and that will be enough. But never does Jesus offer quick gimmicks and instead he only repeats this drumbeat mantra, love God, love each other, love yourselves, love me, love each other. And somehow, that particular way of loving action then invites us back into the mystery. That particular type of loving action gives us access to this spirit advocate who guides us in truth and peace. Jesus promises there is peace in this way. This way will not feel like fear. 
And the Spirit will remind us of all of these words Jesus has spoken any time we begin to forget. On Pentecost Sunday, we often talk about the Holy Spirit as the rabble rouser of the Trinity who breaks into our comfortable world and reorders everything in ways that may shock us and amaze us. We remember when Annie Dillard said, we churches are just children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. We cautiously question if we might welcome such a holy presence because all of that sounds really terrifying. I'm thinking about the time my freshman year of college, I was studying sociology of religion and we were sent to a vineyard church to go study this denominational expression of Christianity. We spent an entire weekend with them and didn't know at the time there are different versions of vineyard churches. And this one came out of the Toronto vineyard, which meant particularly charismatic, which meant barking like dogs, which meant meeting a guy who calls himself Flipper because when he got the spirit, he made us sound like a dolphin. It was terrifying to me. And people would come up to me that whole weekend and say, I have a word for you. God is laying it on my heart to tell you this thing. And I remember being so afraid that God would give them some word that I myself could not say yes to. But God has not given us a spirit of fear. And Jesus promises that there is peace in this way. Yet we're cautious when it comes to the spirit because we don't know quite what that transaction is going to be about. As though the invitation is optional. As though the wind has to request permission before it blows. But we fear the spirit because real change scares us. To think that church may change forever scares us. To think our lives may be rearranged and reordered and unpredictable is unnerving, if not altogether terrifying. We like to have five and 10 and 20 year plans with strategic growth at every marker. We like to know that the Christmas tree is always going to go in the same exact spot with the same decorations and the same falling apart tree skirt that we've used for all these years. We like to know that at tomorrow's Memorial Day picnic, there will be an angel food cake with Cool Whip spread on top and strawberries and blueberries strategically arranged to make a flag. Tradition is comforting. It assures us that something, at least something holds true when everything else in this world, everything else about our lives seems to be wild and unpredictable and is very definitely beyond our control. So let's ask, is this wild and windy spirit of God only unpredictable, only destructive, only chaotic? Not according to John's gospel. For John to be on the way of Jesus is to be in the spirit and that spirit brings peace and truth. This spirit reorders things to connect Jesus followers to that hidden mysterious action of God. And Jesus makes clear that not everyone knows this spirit. So there is some element of volunteerism, a very old Baptist concept. You must want to be known. You must want to know. This spirit is not frightening people in the dark of night. You must have to have at least a hunch, at least a hunch that something about your life needs to be reordered. You must have some kind of stirring within you that being on the way of Jesus requires you to let go of some other ways that no longer serve you, who no longer serve who you are and who you are becoming. But then I might say, who's giving you the hunch? Who's nudging you to ask these questions? It's mysterious the ways that God works. And so this spirit, the spirit of peace and truth, this advocate begins to move and work when you're paying attention. 
when you're getting yourself ready. And it will not be a terrifying process of releasing and rearranging because this spirit brings peace. Oh, we're reminded of that all across the gospels. Do not be afraid, do not fear. This spirit brings peace. The spirit will remind you of the love of Jesus. This spirit is ultimately returning you to your truest and fullest self. The spirit is guiding and nudging you to be the one you were created and breathed to be by God. Like all birthdays and anniversaries, this birthday of the church is a marking day to remind us of our story. What is this thing? What is this thing we are attempting to be all these hundreds and thousands of years later? Some of the work of the Spirit seems to be reminding us, not just destroying old and making new, Spirit reminds us that we, the church, are people of action and people of mystery. We hold tightly and boldly all to all that we know and profess and believe. And we hold loosely and lightly the mysteries of God of which we only catch glimpses and hints and feel like breeze across our skin. When we wonder if we are truly on the path and wish for a sign or that statue's hand to raise, Spirit reminds us of the very thing that Czesław Miosz speaks in his final words of this poem. Call one man anywhere on earth, not me, after all, I have some decency, and allow me when I look at him to marvel at you. It's not ridiculous to look for signs in the lives of others. Maybe it sounds like a ridiculous request on the face of things, send me just one person, but it's not ridiculous to think that we might even be able to look around right here in this room and in one another's faces be reminded of the love of God. After all, I am not the church and you are not the church, but we together mysteriously become the church. Any of us can pursue spirit, open our hearts to the ways of God's love, pursue with our whole selves the ways of Christ. We can, as individuals, commit ourselves to these things, but being the church, this way of action and mystery, it isn't a solo journey. The spirit is not just working in me, thank God, because we'd all be lost if it was all up to only me. The spirit is working in you and the spirit is working in us. And no, I don't know what that means. But I know that there are times that I look into your faces and I'm reminded of the love of God. Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied, Philip implores. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus says. We're not waiting for a sign or the arrival of tongues of fire to appear above our heads or rushing wind to blow through this room and knock the windows open. We know that God is already in and around us. We know that the winding path of Jesus is already laid out before us. And we know that the Spirit of God is present even now in our breath. Look around and see what is already here. Look into each other's faces and know the work of the Spirit and trust her. Release your grip on everything you keep think keeps the world from spinning off its axis. Trust the spirit, trust the path to continue unfolding. Allow us, O oh God, to marvel at you. Amen.
When we come back next week, did you hear all of that? Do I need to start again? I just heard my voice come back in. I said, hello on Zoom, talk to each other in chat. It's really good to be here today. Thank you to everyone's here who stick around and have a cup of coffee afterwards. And it's a holiday tomorrow, so the church office and center offices will be closed. Now we're caught up. When we come back next Sunday, it will be next month. It will be June. And on June 4th and June 11th in the afternoons at four o'clock right here in this room, Sharon Carroll and I, the Reverend Sharon Carroll and I have put together a two week series on death and dying. This is for you, this is for your neighbors, this is for anyone who lives around us. This is for anyone who might die someday. We're going to hear from a pastor and a chaplain and uh, an attorney and a funeral home director and someone who leads a hospice organization about all of those elements of death and dying, the legal stuff, the decisions to be made, who has your passwords. I tell my husband, if something happens to be unexpectedly, cut off this finger because this is the one that will get you into my accounts. Well, we don't have to amputate each other's fingers. We can do things in loving kindness by having legal documents and give me a copy and let us have it in the church office, give it to your neighbor. We have to laugh about these things so that we're not so afraid of them. So we're gonna take some of the fear away by just doing some planning and conversation, talk with each other. We'll be here next Sunday and the Sunday after 4 p.m. to talk about death and dying right here in the church sanctuary. There are some other opportunities that you'll see in your order of service and you'll find on our website. Um, we're gonna ask some people to help bring down chairs next Sunday. We won't talk about that right now. We're gonna ask people to make some cookies and bring them in. You can see a couple of opportunities around anti-racism and criminal legal system reform that are also coming up in the month of June and even into July. And you may engage any of those. Um, and if you have questions, please see me, please see Mark. Um, Caroline Durham is out of the office this weekend, but we'll be back and also glad to answer your questions about any of the center's programming that's going on. Are there announcements for this week ahead that we need to make? Then friends, as you go from this place, may you go not in fear, but with confidence and peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.
morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, hi, whoops. I was going to say, hi, Flora. How are you? You got back from your trip? You're muted. I'm okay. And uh, how are you? You back in Jenna? Yeah, we just got back last night. Yeah. So it was it was good to be with family. Well, I'm very yeah. often. Um, well, I'm thankful for the your safe travels. <laughs> <laughs> well, you too. You enjoyed. Uh, you were with your brothers. Family yeah, or? and and, um, and um, first cousins and second. Well, let's see. Uh, let's see. First cousins removed. <laughs> <laughs> Once removed and first cousins twice, and I think maybe a couple of first cousins cousins three times removed. <laughs> so little little bitty ones. It was great. Well, we didn't have any little bitty ones, but it was good to see my uh, not only my niece but. My great niece and great nephew, who have grown up, of course. Yeah. My my great niece, I was absolutely shocked to find out that she's thirty. <laughs> I was I thinking know. she's about mid twenties, and it's her brother who's mid twenties. <laughs> oh goodness! And uh, both know. have graduated from college, and uh, the niece, a great niece, lives in Columbus, Ohio. I wasn't sure what kind of work she did, but she works for a mortgage company and does marketing and graphics for them. Her, her degree was in uh, medical illustration, so I don't know what any of this oh. has to do with that. But uh, And then my great nephews, uh, well, he worked for the fire department for a while, and uh, uh, he too graduated from college, uh, I think probably in business of some kind, but he's doing uh, what they call logistics now, uh, which I think is mostly a matter of uh, HR and scheduling and that sort of thing for mm -hmm. moving. Companies. But it was it was just really good to <laughs> Let's see them. Also, got to see my cousin Andy that we've prayed for before. Who's uh, uh, well, he had was having uh, dialysis the day we arrived, but they did come by and visit for a while, and then came to the uh, funeral. But he's he's not doing well at all, and he's had all kinds of prep and trying to you know get approved for and be on a waiting list for a kidney transplant. That's fine. So, mm. Hope y'all will continue to pray for him. We will. We will do that. Yeah. I'm so sad about um, Bill's, um, Julie's husband's death. Yeah. Now she, uh, Bill was Myron's grandson. No, no, no. Or Julie. Julie is, is, uh, is Myron's daughter. 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 And uh, now the the grandson is also Bill. I'm not sure. I I, I think both of them go by Bill, but I'm not sure. Did um. But it's um. Julia's husband who died. And he's been near death so many times. Uh, and has always been able to come back. I really didn't know Myron's family very well. I'm, I think I met 
Julie and uh, and Bill, I think. Well, we're. <laughs> We're a lively group. We're a lively group. Yeah. I was going to say I have an excuse for this, but <laughs> <laughs> I have a sinus infection, so I'm not uh, got a very congested this morning. Did anybody see the thing uh, about the notification about WWOZ and no. their move? No. They had they had been notified uh, some time ago that they had to, they have to move August the first from their place in the French Quarter where they've been the last eighteen years. Um, it's not a great place. It's in need of work, especially since Ida. There at one point there was a bullet went through the the uh, broadcast booth, and a few months ago somebody threw a brick through a window. And oh, they have right. been looking, and they've actually found a place at 717 St. Charles Avenue, which is a couple of blocks from Gallier Hall heading toward Lee Circle, or Harmony Circle. And um, WWOZ had voted to, um, their board had voted yes to go for the property. It has 6,200 square feet. It's a safe building. It's ready to move into. There's parking beside it and across the street. Great, and it's on the streetcar line. Great situation. Everybody, because right now the place they have cannot accommodate all the people who work there. So some of them have to work from elsewhere. This would take care of everybody, be comfortable, even has a little patio outside. And, uh, private patio and um the board that includes irma thomas by the way voted to um to do that or i think she's well she's on one of the boards that had to vote anyway wwoz said okay this is the place we want to they are as of sometime a number of years ago they became owned by the jazz and heritage foundation and that board had to approve it and I guess there was some port, a part of the board, the executive board or something that agreed and they had made a bid on the property. Then they took it to the full board and the full board had a cow and uh, he said, oh, this is not a culture. We want it to be in a culturally relevant neighborhood. This does not work for us. It needs to be in, to help the community. It, it does not need to be in some place like St. Charles Avenue. And somebody and Irma Thomas is on one or both of the boards, and she was saying, "It's perfect. What is the problem?" <laughs> <laughs> but they have stopped the purchase of the property, and it is two months from when they have to move. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to figure out what to do. And um, I think her name is Beth Utterback, who used to be at WYES. She's been the director of WWOZ for the last six years. She's got another plan that she's coming up with, but she's going to present that to the board before they say anything but oz is having its problems and part of it because some idiots on the jazz and heritage foundation board seem to think that that's not culturally relevant enough being uh -huh. on the mardi gras parade route near gallier hall and lafayette square and in a hmm. safe place that is safe for the people who work there and they won't have to worry about being shot at or the roof leaking Mm. Honestly, it sounds to me like they were mad that the uh, lower groups tried to move forward without their approval and had a snit about it. They may be part of it, but there is more to it, evidently. But uh, they just pit, had a fit. And they, and in order to get ready for this board meeting, they had even had um, a, a proposal they'd come up with, and they even had... Uh, sign things from other from musicians in the in the community and so forth. They had the backing of the actual musicians, but as Irma Thomas pointed out, culture is not just a location; it's the people. And this building was perfect for them. What is their problem? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Hey Ken, you might want to turn off the recording. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 